Hey guys, this is Elliot the iPad Pro, and in this tutorial you'll get hands-on experience coding big data with Google's Memory Store and Fire Store. I'll also show you a real-life example of how these technologies totally change what's possible with a computer. And then we'll wrap things up by talking about the potential dangers of big data. So if you've never heard of Google Cloud's Memory Store or Fire Store, you really have to watch the first part of this video. Part 1 explains what big data is, and it's where you set up your computer so that you can follow this tutorial. Also, if you haven't heard of I.O., it's this new software that allows you to do professional programming on any device. You can also watch a tutorial about how to install I.O. Okay, so since everyone here has now watched the first video, Big Data Part 1, it's time for us to start coding in Memory Store and Fire Store. So the first thing we should do is make a place for us to work on our project. Go inside public and then create a new folder. We'll rename this folder my underscore first underscore big underscore data. Now we go inside of my first big data and we create a new Python notebook. Once the notebook has finished loading, you can rename the notebook by clicking Untitled. Let's name this new notebook Tutorial. When you see the little blue line next to the first cell, press Ctrl H to hide the header. You can then create a few cells by pressing Shift Enter. This gives us room to work in. Out of the two Google tools, the first topic we're going to cover is Memory Store. This is because Memory Store is a lot simpler to use. Remember that Memory Store is a RAM database whose whole point is to be as fast as possible. For this reason, the code is simple and bare bones. When you're in command mode, which is when you see the blue line, press M to turn the cell into a markdown cell. Then press Enter and type hashtag Memory Store. The first thing we're going to cover is the basics, so create a subheading called Basics. You can import everything you need from Memory Store by typing Import Redis. So Redis is the tool that we use to control Memory Store. Here's some links to a cool interactive tutorial and the documentation. So when you type import Redis, if you got an error message that looks like this, that probably happened because you don't have the latest version of IO. But there's an easy fix to this. You can just go to Google Cloud and then spin up a new IO website. Then just delete your old IO website and you're done. But what about all of your work? Well, there's an easy fix using IO Online. With Manage Files, you can save all of your work onto GitHub. Then you can access your work using Download from GitHub once you set up the new computer. I should also mention that you should check out Update Apps because I update all of my apps regularly, and that will fix other glitches. All right, now let's get back to the tutorial. Now, we've already imported Redis but we have to make a variable that allows us to control the memory store database. I created a variable called db underscore redis. When you create this variable, in your settings you have to put in a IP number and a port number. So these numbers actually come from your Google Cloud console. You can find them on the memory store page. Okay, now we can save data onto memory store. So to save data, you have to decide a name and a location. I'll save the word hello at the location called data. And then if you want to see what's saved at a location, you can use the command git. So we see that the word hello is saved at data. So Redis does do some things a little funny. For instance, let's see what happens when we try to save some numbers on Redis. So when you start doing this, you run the same command as before for saving a word, but this time let's just add a number, 2. Okay, and then to return the number, we run the same command that we run for getting a word back. But we notice that when the number is returned, it has this funny little B in front of it. And then if we try to run a simple command, like doing our variable plus 2, we get an error. This is because the type of our variable is bytes, not a number. But there's a simple fix to this. If we put our variable inside the command int, it will do what we want. Now another really useful command when you're using memory store is being able to delete data. 
When we run this, you see that the data at location called data is now no longer there. So let's say you want to save some more complicated variables in memory store. Well, you can't really save anything that complicated, but you can at least save lists and you can save something called hashes, which is kind of like a dictionary. So right now, I'm going to show you how to save a list. So a list is just a bunch of numbers or words saved under one name. In Python, you do this by using brackets and commas. Now, let's see what happens if we just try to save the list that we created into memory store under the variable name data. This returns an error. And to fix this, you have to put a little asterisk sign in front of my list. To return a list, you use the function lrange. When you use this function, you have to specify which values of the list you want to return. When you do 0 minus 1, you return all the values. As an exercise, try and figure out how this function works. Finally, with a list, you can always add more values to it later. For instance, with our push, we'll add 4 and 5 to the list that we already created. Then when we rerun lrange, we now see that we have those values. So that's about all that I really have time to cover about Memory Store. But on IO Online, you can download Big Data Tutorial. And with that, you'll have this tutorial, but it'll also be fancier and have links to other references that you can use to learn more about Memory Store. Okay, now let's move on to Firestore. So when you start using Firestore, it might seem like it's harder because you have to type more code to get things done. But this is because unlike Memory Store, which can only save simple types of data, Firestore allows you to save much more complicated nested data types. And even though it might require more code, when you use Firestore, it still follows the same basic rules as Memory Store. For instance, like in Memory Store, the first thing you do in Firestore is set things up by importing packages. Now, since this does require a lot more typing, I hope you don't mind if I copy and paste code. So even though there's more lines of code here, you can see that the first cell of Firestore is actually the same as in Memory Store. We're just importing the packages that we need. And actually, the second cell that we run also does the same thing as memory store. But instead of creating a variable called db redis, we create a variable called db fire. So there's one really important thing about how we create db fire. So remember in the last video how we created this key that we put onto the main page of IO and how I said this key would be used later to run Firestore? Well, now you have to copy that key and then you have to type it right here in your code in order to have Firestore work. So we created our variable for controlling Firestore. But before we get into saving and getting data, there's one more command that's important to know. If you ever run into trouble and have to restart Firestore, just rerunning the cell won't work. In order to restart Firestore, you have to run the delete app command to delete the client that's already there. Then you can rerun the cell. Now, just so you don't accidentally run this command, it's smart to comment it out until you actually need to use it. Okay, so let's see how we actually get data in Firestore. So remember that in the last video, we created a collection or folder called YouTubers, and in that folder, we put a document or file called the iPad Pro. Now, if you were to just try to get that document, you wouldn't actually see any output. Instead, you have to turn it into a dictionary to see the data. So if you don't know what a dictionary is, you should watch the tutorial on YouTube. I really recommend Socratica's tutorial. Now with Firestore, there's actually multiple ways to get data. This command does the same thing as the cell above it. But let's say you don't just want to get one of the YouTubers. Instead, what you want to do is get all of the YouTubers. Well, you can do that with this code. So what this code is saying is that for every document inside the collection YouTubers, what we do is we print that document's ID and that document's information to the screen. If you haven't seen for loops before, you should watch a video about them on YouTube. Okay, so now we know how to get data. How do we create data though? 
So remember that in the last video, we also created a collection called videos. Let's say we want to add a document called big data to videos. Well, first we have to decide what we want to say about the video big data. Let's say that this video is four minutes long, has 10 likes, and has a short little description. Now, just like in memory store, in order to save this data, all we have to do is run the set command. To make sure it's there, we can run the git command real fast. Now, one of the things that makes Firestore really special is that we can actually search through and pick and choose the pieces of data that we want. So remember before when we used a for loop to grab all of the YouTubers' data? Well, if we add the command where to the collection, then we can actually choose specific YouTubers. For instance, in this command, we're only choosing the YouTubers who have more than 100,000 subscribers, which in this case is just Eugene Kortoyansky. Okay, so I've shown you what Memory Store and Firestore can do. Now, as promised, let's do a real-world example. Now, for this tutorial, we're going to be using one of the apps I built called Cytoscape. So one really cool thing about Jupyter applications is that you can actually run them inside other notebooks. To load in the Cytoscape app, run this command. Now, to actually see Cytoscape, run graph.embed. So Cytoscape is an application that you can use to build graphical networks. But a cool thing about Cytoscape is that you can also load in data. For instance, if you download the big data tutorial, you can move the coconut file to your my first big data. Then when you go back to the tutorial, and you scroll down to the load save box, if you click HTML and then you refresh, you'll see the coconut.html. Let's load that data set into Cytoscape. And then we see the graph. So this graph is about these things called proteins in biology. And so you've probably heard of protein and you think that that's the thing that's inside muscle, right? Well, it turns out that proteins are actually things that are inside every single one of your cells. In your cell, there's actually thousands of different types of proteins. And if you think of your cell as being a factory, then the proteins are the little machines in the factory that are working together. But in this case, what that factory is building is actually another completely new factory. And the reason why biologists build these little models of how proteins work is because if we can understand how they work together, then we can understand how a cell works. So when we click on a protein, we actually see some information appear about what that protein does. So one really cool thing about Cytoscape is we can actually save this type of information right into Python where we can use it. All you have to do is click save, and then under Python, click save again. Now this will save the data into something called a pandas data frame. And then we can run graph.data to see the data frame. So if you haven't heard of pandas, it's a really great package in Python for doing data analysis. I'll put a link to some really great pandas tutorials inside the big data tutorial. Okay, so now you might be thinking, well, all of this is great, but what does any of this have to do with big data? Well, in this example, you might see just five proteins, but in a cell in the human body, there's 20,000 different proteins, and there are millions of connections between these different proteins. And with Cytoscape, if you try to load in all of that information at once, it will just break the application. But with Memory Store and Firestore, there's a beautiful and simple algorithm that makes it so that you can display all of that information at once, and then the user can zoom in at any part of the graph and then see the pieces of the cell that they want to see. So in this tutorial, I don't really have time to go into the math of how this works, but I can at least show you how to load data from Cytoscape into Firestore and Memory Store. So first, let's use some panda commands to get just a table about the nodes. 
and then another table about the edges. So one really great thing about pandas is that you can see you don't have to type very much code to do a lot of stuff. Now what we're going to do first is add the nodes to Firestore. We can add the nodes to Firestore by running this command. So what this command does is it creates a new collection or folder called protein. And then for each row in the nodes table, it creates a new file or document called the label of that row. And then it adds as a description the info about that protein. To get a better idea of what this command does, you can try just running the print line. To check that this command worked, we can try getting the last name that was ran inside the for loop. And we see it works. Okay, now let's try adding the edges to memory store. But before we start adding the edges, let's create a little map between the ugly names of the edges and the nicer names of the proteins. This just makes the information in our database easier to read. Then we run this command to add the data to memory store. We can then try getting one of the proteins to check that it works. This output tells us that MAP2K1 has an edge pointing to MAP-K1 and RAD52. And we see that it totally does. Alright, so we just saw how we can use Memory Store and Fire Store to help solve a real-world problem in biology. So in this example, we went through a lot of information, so it's probably good to go through all the steps again to get a better understanding of how it all works. But before we go, I think it's really important to talk about how people's view of big data has changed in the last year or so. So when you look at the news, a lot of the headlines are things like big data, bigger problems, with the first sentence being big brother is watching you. And I'm not just cherry picking news stories. When you search big data on YouTube, literally the first thing that comes up is a video called Big Data Dangerous with 13 million views. So usually when someone tells me that they don't like big data, what they mean is that they don't like it that a few engineers at a few companies use big data. And I think it's important that we remind people that big data is not one company. It's an entirely new field of science. For instance, the example I gave from biology came from when I was working in a medical lab that was trying to find better treatments for cancer. And for the people who use big data, it's an absolute miracle. For instance, that thing I was telling you about where I can visualize any graphical network of any size only became possible in the last six months. And every year a new technology comes out that totally changes what I can do. And I believe it's really important that we get that message out there because public opinion really matters. Also, I think we should talk about people's worries about the large internet companies and their data. So people like to call Facebook a social media company, but really, I think it's better if we call businesses like that just a media company. Because that better explains the changes that are happening right now. So in any country, at any time in history, media has always been really important because they decide what people hear. Back in the early 1900s, newspapers had a ton of power, and what they printed could start wars. And then that power shifted to the television, and now that power is shifting to the internet. And whenever there's a big shift in power and a new way that people are receiving information about the world, there are going to be some risks and some mistakes. However, does that mean that these large media companies are evil and should be stopped? Personally, I believe that we should give people more information about these technological changes so they're less scared about the transitions that are occurring. And as with the media companies of the past, I believe that with proper regulation, the media companies of the future will be able to benefit society. And we should especially remind people about all the other wonderful things that big data is changing. Alright, so what did you guys think of the tutorial? What other types of things would you like to see in IO? Let me know in the comments. Also, if you enjoyed the video, click like and subscribe. This is Elliot the iPad Pro. See you guys next video.